afternoon. Today I will be talking about tourism concessions in national parks as neoliberal tools for a conservation economy in New Zealand. National parks, as you might know, constitute major tourism attractions in New Zealand. The Department of Conservation, which I will abbreviate as DOC, is responsible for nature conservation, but it is also responsible for building and maintaining recreational and tourism facilities, according to the 1987 Conservation Act. What prompted me to do research on this topic? Well, there are three major developments recently that have uh, contributed to my interest in this research project. First, we see an intensification of national parks used by visitors, especially by international visitors. Second, in New Zealand, the legal policy frameworks for guiding the issue of tourism concessions um, has been recently deregulated to enable more businesses to make a living in natural areas, including in national parks. Since 2009, when the neoliberal government has come into power, uh, the neoliberal government has implemented a business growth agenda, which has a program um, called Building Natural Resources. This program aims to increase the contribution of all economic uh, sectors relying on natural, tourism, natural resources, such as tourism, to the national GDP to 40% by 2015. So this is quite an ambitious uh, goal. And this is referred to in New Zealand as greening growth or sustained growth from natural resources, which should underpin the New Zealand model for a conservation economy. Third, all this intensification of use and deregulation, this is happening on the background of an already inadequate tourism uh, planning and policy at national level and based on an old visitor planning framework that already has uh, some cracks in the system. Now, in this context, the research question that has emerged is what are the prospects for sustainable tourism and recreation in national parks in New Zealand, given the recent shifts in regulation and governance to facilitate a conservation economy? And I split this big research question into four sub-questions, but I would rather go through the answers and findings to each of these questions. In the literature uh, review that I explain in the paper, I argue that concessions are key tools for managing national parks uh, sustainably. Countries use different visitor planning frameworks that are guiding the issue of uh, tourism concessions. And in this slide, I summarized the six more frequent, most frequently used uh, frameworks as assessed across six criteria by Newsom's and Newsom and colleagues. New Zealand is using the recreation opportunity spectrum, which is listed in the first row, since 1993. And as you can see, this is one of the frameworks that is performing the worst across the six uh, elected criteria by Newsom and colleagues. In this slide, I summarized the main findings for the first research question. Basically, the problem is that DOC, the Department of Conservation, is legislatively and institutionally very poorly equipped to manage the whole conservation estate, including national parks, holistically. There are two what I call legal disabilities that are important in this respect. First, since the deregulation of all economic sectors in early 90s, New Zealand doesn't really have a national tourism policy and planning approach. Second, the Department of Conservation is unable to impose entry fees in national parks because of some regulations in the 1980 National Tourism Act. It means that it has to rely on other, uh, other methodologies like uh, hot fees and camping fees and so on. But the problem is that tourism concession at this stage only contribute to 
maximum 5% of DOC's annual budgetary needs. Um, we also see problems with the ROS system I mentioned earlier, the, ROS, uh, the Recreation Opportunity Spectrum Planning Framework. This table shows how the framework was implemented in, uh, with respect to the National Park uh, Mancook. Each management plan needs to specify what kinds of tourism activities and facilities are allowed where and to what extent. That's how a raw scheme works. What you see in the last two rows of this uh, 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 table is that they refer to the problem of aircraft noise pollution. This problem affects many national parks in New Zealand and I'm using it just as an illustration of, uh, illustration of cracks in the system because the Department of Conservation is limited in the management measures that it may undertake with respect to this air pollution, uh, uh, pro noise pollution problem because it has no legal competencies to regulate what happens on the airspace above national parks. Another recent problem uh, re uh, re resulting from the conservation economy impetus is a shift in the balance of power between DOC and the tourism industry in New Zealand. For example, we have recently seen attempts by the tourism industry to put pressure on DOC to change the National Park Management Plan so that they can accommodate more concessions to build more roads and to approve more aircraft landings on glaciers in the Westland National Park, uh, which is very famous for its glaciers on the west coast of New Zealand. So the idea is that the ROS framework for planning uh, does seem vulnerable to being watered down due to business pressures. Now this slide summarizes the key changes in the new legal regime for tourism concessions. First, we see that there are longer contracts being issued. For example, for aircraft and water-related activities, we see now that the minimum contract length is 20 years, which is a lot up from the past five years. Also, we see that there is less public notification and information and consultation in, in regard to concessions. We now hardly see concessions um, that are shorter than 10 years being publicly notified. Another change is that the department gets actually less time to assess concession applications, which might have implications for the quality of that assessment and the quality of concession design. Also a bit worrying is that at national level, we see that there are only 31 full-time positions involved in permission for tourism concessions. Further, there is the issue of having a weak regulation of the so-called monopoly concessions, which are needed sometimes because of ecological sensitivities. We have to limit the number of companies allowed to operate in some sensitive uh, uh, ecosystems. Now, the main message here is that the Tourism Industry Association exerts quite high political pressure so that the conservation minister does not exert his legal right to use the competitive method of tendering the concession allocation. Instead, the industry puts pressure to use the least competitive method, which is that of preferential right to apply of the incumbent monopoly concessionaires. In my paper, I also address the issue of DOC's performance on monitoring and enforcement. For example, there is a very low rate of monitoring concession contracts, usually between 15 and 22% of the concessions are annually monitored. And this is difficult to understand because the legal framework offers the department good tools to do monitoring and also uh, full recovery, full cost recovery mechanism. So the cost shouldn't be an issue. Now, when monitoring does occur, um, 
the system reveals important uh, uh, problems and bottlenecks. For example, DOC has difficulties uh, proving contract non-compliance in courts. So because of that, some concessionaires with clear contract breaches um, get the opportunity to have their contracts renewed. Besides, joint ventures and concessionaire ownership changes also can make it very difficult uh, for DOC from legal standpoint and legal technicalities to decline concession applications from concessionaires that haven't performed uh, greatly in the past. Finally, some reflections on unfulfilled hopes. The analysis of concession contracts reveals that the conservation gains that were hoped for, expected by DOC minister uh, on issuing concessions, is hard, more concessions, is hard to see. There is no evidence at this stage of ambitious environmental requirements being included in concession contracts of the type recommended in international guidelines. Also, there is a culture in New Zealand uh, in concessions design and management that if concessioners avoid, rectify and mitigate environmental impacts, that all should be fine. So in conclusion, um, the governance approach for tourism in national parks in New Zealand is clearly in transition as a result of a recent neoliberal return. Significant demand-oriented regulatory changes have been implemented in what remains fundamentally a very supply-oriented legal and institutional framework. This historic framework already had its own limitations and incoherences, which led to the creation of hotspots of overcrowding, pollution and biodiversity value decreases in some parks. So in my view, it is perhaps wider, wiser to swing the governance approach and transition towards a 21st century approach characterized by a more innovative, demand-oriented perhaps planning framework using uh, market uh, pricing strategies and using genuine partnerships with businesses for genuine biodiversity gains.